Okay, welcome to episode 22 of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, where we celebrate the work of the greatest storyteller of the of the 20th century uh, by by just analyzing his work. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I am uh, the author of several books on what I call pre-digital pop culture, things like Old Time Radio, about the pulp magazines that Burroughs published in, and so on. Um, I keep a blog about such things. It's at comics, Old Time Radio, and um uh other cool stuff um and i'm joined by jess and scott jess you want to introduce yourself good evening one and all my name is jess terrell and you probably know me from the facebook discussion group the love of all things edgar rice burrows where with some 5,000 plus burrows fans we're talking erb uh pretty much 24 7. Uh, i'm also an advanced reader for um, erb inc uh so I get an opportunity to look at books while they're in the works. Uh, but any opinions I express here or in my discussion group or on the street or wherever I am are my own opinions. I also do some writing for um, some fan magazines. Uh, but come join us for love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. Scott? And I'm Scott Stewart. Uh, nothing really to promote tonight uh, except that I'm just a uh, freelance writer. Okay, and tonight we are going to be looking at Burroughs's book, The Eternal Savage, which um, is also known as The Eternal Lover. Um, it has an interesting publishing history. It was uh, the first half of the novel was printed as the was published as The Eternal Lover in All Story Weekly magazine on March seventh, nineteen fourteen. Uh, the second half of the novel was serialized in All Story Weekly in January of February of 1915. Um, it was combined together into a book uh, in 1925, um, and it has been re- with a uh, yeah, J-, J. Allen St. John dust jacket, really cool artwork. Like many of Burroughs' book, it's been blessed by great cover artists. There was an ace paperback uh, done in 1963 with Roy Krenkel art, and later on, there was a uh, Frazetta cover, which I think is my favorite cover, uh, favorite image from this story. Um, so it uh, it is. Uh, um, so it was just originally just a novella, uh, but Burroughs then wrote a sequel and it was all combined into one single novel um, and an interesting and fun novel, too. We'll, I think we're going to have fun talking about it. Um, I will say, since this novel does tie into The Mad King in a way, which we reviewed on a couple of podcast episodes a little while back, that The Mad King was written first, but the first part of this book, The Eternal Lover, was actually published first. Uh, Burroughs wrote the first part of The Mad King in 1913 and then wrote The Eternal Lover. The Eternal Lover was published a week before The Mad King in um in uh, all, Sto- all Story Weekly. But it is set, as we'll be talking about, it is set between parts one and part two of The Mad King. Um, so, it, um, and, but before we get into the novel, um, you know, I think I hear something. <laughs> And yes, that that's the apes of Ker, of the tribe of Kershak. They're reminding us that our new fir, my first ERB feature uh, is going to start tonight, in which we share stories about readers' first time experience reading one of Burroughs' novels. And we uh, Jim is a fan of the podcast who lives in England, and he told us this story, and I'm quoting from him now. I'm a longtime ERB fan, discovering him uh, in a secondhand bookstore back in the early '80s. Oddly enough, Tarzan and the Castaways was the first po- uh, paperback I picked up after enjoying the Tarzan Filmation series and, of course, the Weissmuller movies that used to be on every Friday night, which I used to watch with my dad. I also found my, my co- a copy of Lupoff's Master of Adventure early on and was thrilled to see that there were so many novels to collect. Without that, I would, never would have known about some of the more obscure titles. But I go back to Apes and Princesses again and again, um, I'm throwing on the audiobook whenever life gets tough, so that I can find so so as I find they renew my courage to face whatever life throws at me. That's the spirit of resilience and self-reliance 
that never give up spirit encapsulated in I still live. Fast forward 40 years, and I've read everything other than the Mar than Marsa on the doorstep and still love to escape into the wonderful world of Burrosania with its myriad fast, fantastic landscapes, vivid characters, and strong ethics. These days I'm a parent too, and have converted my son Harry to a love of all things ERB. He's now 10, and we're working through the books together. We just finished Gods of Mars, but, uh, but his favorite remains the Beasts of Tarzan, which would be great if you could do a special on that sometimes. So that's the end of the quote. Jim, thanks for living. Um, Harry, you have a cool dad, uh, and you obviously share his great taste in fiction. And we will be doing The Beasts of Tarzan as the next book on our schedule. So we appreciate the recommendation. And anyone else listening who has a first ERB story, you can email us or you can post it on any of the social media or podcast sites uh, on which we share this podcast. Uh, let us know um, what your first experience in reading a Burroughs book was. And uh, you know, make sure you let us know. It's okay for us to share it on the podcast uh, because we, we'd love to be able to do this feature again. Um, and that's it for uh, my first ERB. Um, and we are about to dive into our discussion of the novel, I believe. So I think I was starting off with part one, chapter one of the novel, um, in which we jump back 100,000 years and we meet New, that's N-U, son of New. Um, he's described as a troglodyte. In my mind, a troglodyte is like this almost Neanderthal creature, but he's actually, by modern standards, a good-looking human male. And he's out to hunt O, O, -O spelled O, O, the saber-toothed tiger, to prove he's worthy of the love of Nat Ol, the daughter of his tribe's chief, uh, the chief of his tribe. Um, the Burroughs jumps right in with some great adventure stuff as New has to dodge a rhino. Um, and as he makes his way to to the cave of the saber tooth tiger, um, he we learn that he can speak the language of the Mangani, that he can talk with the uh, the monkeys that he passes, and this indicates that he is only recently that his tribe has fairly recently in human history risen up from the apes, and they have not lost their knowledge of that original language yet. Uh, he eventually finds Ooh, the saber tooth. Um, it's what follows is just a typically epic Burroughs battle scene, which uh, he's always, Burroughs always writes an exciting and um, a clever battle scene um, in, in which he manages to kill the, um, to kill the saber tooth and cut off its head so he can take it back to its girlfriend. So, uh, you know, any guys listening, if you want to just impress your girl, apparently the head of a saber tooth dagger is an established way to do that. Uh, but there's an earthquake. He runs into the cave where the saber tooth live, but he's buried alive by the collapse of that cave entrance. Um, and that is like chapter one um, of of the of, of the book, starting in the distant past. Um, and I think he I think Burroughs in this chapter does some very good world building very quickly. Um, he gives us the situation. He lets us know that it is prehistoric with some prehistoric animals, such as the saber tooth still around. Um, he establishes that the Mangani language is still shared by humans. And um, um, he puts in a great battle scene. So he sets up the, uh, the, his world for this novel very quickly and very efficiently. Um, any comments from you guys on this, on this chapter? Well, I think you got it covered pretty well there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to make a comment about the name of the saber tooth uh, O, and, mm -hmm. he, and definitely, um, and and he is a shall we say, even though he's lost his head already, he's a recurring <laughs> creature mm -hmm. in, the, in the story. Um, but it's spelled O O, and it occurred to me while preparing for the podcast, I'm going to try to call him O O, and that's because <laughs> when I'm wandering around, I bump into saber tooth. The first thing I say is O O. <laughs> <laughs> So it just seems to fit. By all yeah. means, you'll call him, call him wherever you think is appropriate. I think we're both talking about the same I, creature. I kind of wish uh, he'd he'd provided you know he provided a, that Burroughs had provided a pronunciation guide 
You know, is it um, OO? Is it O? Is it OO? Like in O look or what? You know, so um, uh, news not around to ask anymore. So we just got to do the best we can, I guess. But by any, by, you're correct. Uh, but by any name or pronunciation, that's a saber tooth, which is to be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the the other thing, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but I think it's an important point to make. Uh, the topic of earthquakes will will also reappear here later on in the story. I don't want to steal any thunder. I just want to make sure we point that out. Yeah. Um, now, for chapter two, we jump ahead a hundred thousand years. So we're now in modern Africa at the estate of uh, John Clayton uh, and his wife, uh, Jane. So the Lord and Lady Greystoke. So this is uh, Tarzan and Jane. Uh, so and uh, they have they are being visited by Barney Custer of Beatrice, Nebraska and Victoria Custer, uh, his his sister. So here we have Burroughs's first. Um, um, uh, indication that he is tying all his novels together into one cohesive universe. <clears throat> um, it's it's just not just that we have this guest starring Tarzan guest starring. Also, we have Barney Custer, who is the main character from The Mad King, and it will later become apparent, especially anybody who bought uh, All Story Weekly the next week to read the first part of The Mad King, that this is set between. Um, uh, after the first part of Mad King had uh, ended. So Barney has been to that small European country where he has his adventure, and he's had to leave behind the girl he fell in love with, and at this point thinks that he's lost her forever. Because so there's a mention that in the novel that he's there to try and help forget. So it's clear that this is set after part one of The Mad King. Um, so anyone reading this originally in All Story Weekly would wonder what the heck Barney is supposed to forget and find out about that when they read uh, The Mad King then, um, a week later. Um, so uh, um, they're, they're doing some big game hunting, and there's several other people visiting as well. Um, and during one hunt, they pass a volcanic outcrop, and um, Victoria has a phobe. She's proven herself to be a brave person and she's good in the hunts and she can nail prey herself, but she does have a phobia about earthquakes. Um, and she's also been dreaming about a particular guy who we're later going to find out is new, the caveman that we have met uh, from the previous chapter. And we also meet William Curtis, a guy who's in love with Victoria and is also staying at the Greystoke estate. And also Lieutenant Otto Butzow, who is a, Another character from the Mad King, who is now a friend of Barney's, um, and uh, you know, Curtis asked Victoria to marry him. She's actually about to accept because she has she's been saying no to proposals because of this guy who keeps appearing in her dreams, and she's convincing herself that that's silly and that Curtis is a good man and that they would make a good marriage. Um, and he's come halfway around the world to see her again. So, but then there's an earthquake and Victoria flees the bungalow she's in and faints in her brother's arm. And um, Lady Greystoke ministers to Victoria. And it's mentioned, by the way, that Lady Greystoke's daughter, uh, son, Jack, is still a baby, which is just another thing to fuel the fire of the great Korak chronology mystery. Um as uh, you know, as we know in *Son of Tarzan*, um, which I believe was written after this, uh, uh, that that story obviously stretches over some years. Uh, while while the young Jack Clayton, who becomes Korak the Killer in the Jungle, grows up, but in a couple of Tarzan novels down the line, we're going to find out that Korak is an adult during World War One, and in fact served in the military. Uh, so, but here he's a baby in a novel set just before World War One begins, which means he couldn't have been more than three or four when the war ends. So, just another, uh, just another factor in the uh, the great debate amongst Burroughs fans about uh, when the heck Jack was born and how old he was. Um, 
because you can't be a baby in 1914 and be fighting on the front lines in 1918. <laughs> so any comments from you guys about that chapter? I, I was just going to say regarding the great Korok time discrepancy, um, you're correct. It's uh, one of the bigger mysteries, and there are several uh, mm -hmm. Alan Burroughs works that the fans and scholars uh, speculate on. I did double check. And uh, yes, these events, based on the chronology that I prefer, and there are different chronologies to look at, mm -hmm. and it's I, you know, there's a case to be made for each correct one, if there is a correct one. But uh, based on the chronology I use, that yes, these events that we're going to hear about with this Eternal Savage slash Eternal Lover book, these events do take place prior to uh, Son of Tarzan. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, because son of, by Son of Tarzan starts out when Jack is a young man, or a young teen at least. So, well, give or take. Yeah. yeah, that would have to be, you know, some years in advance, and what you would think would be after World War I. But, you know, um, I think Philip Jose Farmer had a theory that Jack the baby was their birth son, and they had adopted another boy who becomes Korak the killer and was a little older. I don't really care for that. I like the idea of Korak literally being Tarzan's son. But there's yeah. a lot of theories out there to try and, and settle this discrepancy. So in Chapter 3, we find out that the earthquake uh, opened the cave where New has been in suspended animation, it turns out, for 100,000 years. Um, he, uh, he, makes, you know, he finds himself in what is a strange world. It's a different jungle with different animals in it than the one that he uh, um, knew about. And as far as he can tell, from his point of view, no time has come by. He's not aware of the fact that um, that 100,000 years has gone by. Um, I think it's interesting that his kind of primitive outlook, which is, you know, how do I find food? How do I survive and all of that, makes him accept this new world really quickly. He doesn't drive himself nuts trying to figure out how things have changed. He just he doesn't understand it, but he sim simply accepts it because he needs to move on to the next thing in his life. Um, I think he's a lot more common accepting of this than a civilized man would be. Uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, he talks to some of the monkeys, so it shows that the Mangani language, which is so primitive, has not changed or evolved at all over 100,000 years. Um, but um, no, but none of the monkeys have heard of his tribe. They're all, um, they show him some edible fruits, but he still needs meat. And he hunts a zebra and kills it with a single throw of the spear. Um, uh, and this demonstrates how powerful he is because he throws the spear and it goes halfway through the body of the zebra. Um, while he's eating this, he senses other people approaching. And so he moves into the forest to hide. Um, and so chapter one was from the point of vote a point of view of new in the distance past. Chapter two is in what was the present, about 1913 or so, and from the point of view of Victoria. Chapter three switches back to the point of view of new. And this was a fairly common technique for Burroughs when he wasn't writing in the first person, um, when he wasn't writing directly from his hero's point of view. He often switched points of view between chapters as a way of building tension and uh, um, uh, giving us little mini cliffhangers throughout the novel. And he does it very effectively throughout Eternal Savage, I think. Uh, that's chapter three. Any comments from you guys on it? As I recollect, as I recollect another thing that uh, New is looking for is the restless sea. This is a huge body of water that is visible from where he lives back 100,000 years ago. But over the course of that 100,000 years, uh, uh, it has uh, dried up, shifted locations, so none of the monkeys or other animals he speaks with in Tarzan's modern-day Africa do not know anything about this restless sea. Does that sound correct? I think that does sound correct. Yes, that is correct. And I guess there's been, like, continental drift and all of that over the over the millennia. So, right. yeah, there's no, there's no sea there, and there should be as far as new is concerned. So he is, as far as he can tell, and what is literally a different world, and he has no way, no idea how to get home. But I also agree, he is amazingly uh, mature and calm compared mm -hmm. to other 
Cro Magnons I know that we've encountered along the way. <laughs> I mean, I, I know people who were born, born in Pluster just a few years ago, and they would they would go nuts in this kind of situation. <laughs> uh, Scott, I think you were trying to say something there. I interrupted you earlier. Uh, no, that's that's all right. Um, I, I I did find it interesting that he was able to in some way converse or communicate with the monkeys, though, and and the information he's trying to find out what they gave him was actually is actually quite detailed mm-hmm. the fact that he's looking for his people and they know or his tribe and they know nothing nothing of them i just i thought that was interesting of considering your time we're talking about and maybe a different species of the monkeys or however that might be but uh something in that primal nature mm-hmm. he he has a closer communication with them than we'll see he does with uh modern uh, humans yeah that's true and i and i guess you can just say that you'd probably argue that the because the the monkeys and the other primates do not have the same level of intelligence and imagination as humans their language has just pretty much always stayed the same there's no reason yeah. from their point of view for the language to us to to change or for new back vocabulary to be ad- added so they're speaking the same language that their ancestors a hundred thousand years ago spoke. Um, so, and that you know, from a from a Burroughs universe point of view, I think that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. um, in chapter four, we go back to a point of view of Victoria. Uh, she wakes up. She's still kind of dreaming about her avatar, about this dream man that she, uh, and she just knows when she wakes up that she can't marry Curtis. She doesn't love him. She's waiting for a guy that, as far as she knows, doesn't really exist. Um, Barney is, uh, you know, her brother is is urging her to accept Curtis's uh, uh, proposal and just forget about this other other guy. But she stays behind when um, the men ride off to uh, go off on a hunt. And uh, um, the, we, we, we go. We the point of view switches to the hunters who find the zebra that New killed, and a big game hunter who's with him says it's a man's kill because he can see where the meat was cut out of the haunches. Um, but you know, New had recovered his spear, so all they see is the wound. Now Tarzan, who is with them, recognizes that he hasn't been shot with a gun. The only he he sees it must have been a spear. Um, but he can't believe he actually questions his senses here. He doesn't see how this could have been done by a man. Um, even though as far as all his senses, jungle senses are, are, um, are, are concerned, it was done by a man. Um, so he just, Tarzan is at a loss here. And I think this is the first of several times where I believe Burroughs did not want Tarzan to overshadow the story. And I don't think Tarzan is completely up to speed in this, in this book. This is just one of several times where I, I think Tarzan should have figured stuff out more quickly or doesn't quite act as decisively as he normally does. Um, and, uh, um, and that's just you know a matter of opinion, and it's not an important aspect of the story. He is very much a supporting character in the story, not the primary hero. But I think that Burroughs was kind of pulling Tarzan back a little, simply because he didn't want him to overwhelm the story. This isn't Tarzan's story; it's somebody else. It's new in in Victoria, um, and so Tarzan just doesn't quite do as it doesn't seem quite as capable in my eyes, when I was reading it, as he normally is. Did, did either of you get struck by that? That you know, uh, Tarzan maybe should have performed a little better throughout the first half of this novel than, than he does? I think it goes along with what you're saying. He He's a uh, supporting character or a sounding device mm-hmm. for what's going on. And, um, you know, to have a spear... If you've ever hunted with arrows or, uh, you know, used rifles and stuff, that's not even guarantee a, a bullet will pass all the way through a, an animal's body or flesh or a man's. Mm-hmm. The idea that someone could throw a spear 
and completely exit out the other side is a feat of strength. I think you'd be a little quiet about kind of like going like, okay, mm-hmm. what's going on here? Because <laughs> this just ain't natural. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, by the way, I'm going to like pick on Tarzan a little tiny bit in this first half. It in no way spoils the fun of the story. This is a great adventure story and uh, very thoughtful yeah. in some ways. So, um, so, and then we're going to, you know, at the end of the novel, we're going to, uh, deal with the issue of whether any of this happened or whether it was just a dream of Victoria's or whether it was a timeline that got canceled out because some weird stuff's going to happen in regard to that at the end. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is Victoria's dream image of Tarzan and she just doesn't herself know how capable Tarzan could be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, chapter five, um, we find, we go back to news point of view and he's seen this hunting party. Um, he sees what uh, at first he thinks they have strange skins until he realizes those are clothes and he doesn't see the point of those at first. Uh, he sees them shoot a deer so that he gets respect for what a rifle can do. Um, in this hunting party, they've been looking for a lion that's been killing sheep. They don't find it. They return to the bungalow. So after dark, he approaches the bungalow. And there's a little instance in here I think is interesting where he sees um, everybody. Uh, dining together and there's a part of him that wants to join in on that companionship um, which I thought was a, just an interesting bit of establishing new as a, as a, as a human being um, and not just this like caveman superhero but um, he sees Victoria and he thinks it's his girlfriend that all she's a, um, a, 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 a looks just like her um, but she's wearing the strange clothes. She's associating with all these other strange people. He Once again, he doesn't know what's going on. Um, at, at one point, he says her name. And uh, some people invis- investigate, thinking it might be the, the sheep-killing lion. Um, New keeps out of their sight until the men give up and return. Um, then he kills one of Tarzan's sheep himself to get some... some um, some dinner um and the chapter ends with this lion that's been killing the sheep approaching from the plane keeping silent and downwind from everyone else so we end, once again we end with a little bit of a cliffhanger um so i do like that i do like that little bit of characterization for new that he sees everybody at dinner talking to each other having companionship and he obviously misses that he doesn't know where his tribe is doesn't know we'll ever find him again and he does have a natural desire for human uh, companionship. Um, and I think that's a little lie, but it helps establish, it helps give us sympathy for New and to think of him as just a, a person like ourselves, although most of us can't throw a, a spear through a zebra. Um, so any comments from you all on Chapter 5? Nope. Oh, okay. Jess, you were... <laughs> Jess, you were going to pick up with chapter six. Yes, I have it right here. This is, uh, and we're still in part one. This is chapter six entitled New and the Lion. Before I get into it here, I've got a couple things. Going back to your comment a moment ago about Tarzan seeming to hold back in this story. Yes, I've noticed that too. And I've read this story several times. I noticed it more this time around than I ever have on previous reads. It, it reminds me a little bit. Of course, I'm a Superman fan, as, as, as you all might know. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, of reading a Superman adventure, and Clark Kent's there, and he's investigating Mystery Crawley as a reporter for the Daily Planet. And he may, it can't, Clark Kent may speculate on something, he may say something, or he may just keep his mouth shut be, because he's holding back. A Superman, of course, he could probably figure it out there on the spot or have a good idea, but he's not going to betray his, himself because uh, he wants everyone to think he's Clark Kent, so he's going to hold it to himself. But later on, by story's end, Superman will tell everything, and the reader will hear it from Superman's mouth, and everyone will be happy. We don't get that kind of reveal from Tarzan in this. Uh, Tarzan, if he's seeing some of these things, he's holding them back, uh, but he never really reveals it, um, uh, the, the things that he, that he may have discovered. Because there's some things here where I can say, well, Tarzan should have spotted that, or Tarzan should have done that. 
but you're but you're not really seeing that in this story. And again, it's a good story. I've always enjoyed Eternal Savage slash Eternal Lover. I, I refer to it by the way as both titles because it's been mm-hmm. published under under two titles. Uh, it, it's a fine story. And I enjoy it. It's just that it's a little strange to see Tarzan. What I say either miss things or just hold back now maybe he's having a day off maybe this is indeed a dream if you as you speculated uh, so there's different explanations for it. it's still a fine story uh another thought um which we may or may not choose to, to pursue another thought is that um burroughs was auditioning a uh another character uh new in this case to be uh like a if not a replacement let's say a supplement to tarzan someone else that who could provide stories that Burroughs could do more more stories on. Uh, I, I think that at some point Burroughs was, I don't want to say he was tired of Tarzan because certainly that was a very lucrative character for him, very popular and very, very significant in society. Uh, but I think Burroughs also wanted to be able to write about other characters. He, I, I distinctly recall the incident, and I can't find where it is, but I've read this someplace, where uh, Burroughs said he wanted to write a Korok story, and the editor said, "No, the public wants Tarzan. Give us. They don't want Korok. They want they want Tarzan. So that's why we have some t- twenty four Tarzan books from from Burroughs, and they're all fine stories. I enjoy all of them, but I, I do wish we'd had some Korok stories to go with it. Thanks to Russ Manning, we do have a few. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, so it's possible that uh, Burroughs. I just toss this out as food for thought. I'm not pushing the idea. Not pushing it at all. But it's possible that the Burroughs was trying to develop another character where he could do, who could gain some popularity, uh, be it new in this case, or perhaps the Mucker was another name that came up um, as as a possibility for that, um, where he could do a series of stories with that character. So that that could be what's happening there. Maybe I just I just toss it out as food for thought. Yeah, um, you, know, you know another possibility, uh, Jane. Early in their marriage, Jane wanted Tarzan to stay mostly in England and to not, you know, hang out in the jungle anymore. And she obviously loosened up on that as time went by. But maybe this is like Tarzan not using all his abilities because he doesn't want to get Jane mad at him. So. <laughs> no, that could be. I, 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 I know other husbands who have kept their mouth shut just to keep peace in the family. Yeah, so I think that's got a good point there. Yeah, uh, I think the, the events of, of some of Tarzan with uh, – uh, Jack, a uh, young Korok, uh, breaking out on his own, and might be one of the things that uh, that finally pulled them out of England. Um, mm-hmm. but we can discuss that on another podcast, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing, and I might be stealing, uh, Tim or Scott, I might be stealing your thunder, so speak up and jump in here, because I don't mean to steal anybody's thunder. Another thing I want to make sure we recommend, talking about uh, time travel and stories uh, that have dreams as a central element, of them, and this is the story uh, somewhere in time, mm-hmm. uh, written by Richard Matheson. It was a fine movie with Chris Reeve and Jane Seymour some years ago, right after Reeve's first uh, Superman uh, movie. Um, and there's some there's some time travel involved there, uh, some dreaming of an impossible uh, uh, lover. Uh, of course, Burl's story was written first, but um, somewhere in time has some small similarities to this. So I would recommend taking a look at. At either the movie or the story, somewhere in time, or Richard Matheson. Matheson was an accomplished writer, did some work for Twilight Zone, among other things. He's written many mm-hmm. five times. Yeah, a uh, Star Trek episode too. So yes. All right, you all are waiting on me to get to do chapter six, so I reckon I better get moving on it. <laughs> so back now, we're still in um, Eternal Savage slash Eternal Lover Part One, Chapter Six, entitled "New and the Lion." And also New's dad, who is new father of New, no kidding, uh, will appear later on in the story. And I will attempt to always distinguish if I'm talking about New the son or New the father. So here for the next few minutes, I'll be talking about New the son, also known as New, son of New. Old New and New New. You could say that. <laughs> that actually, that might work better. That's a good idea. So, this is, <laughs> so Victoria's having trouble sleeping. And I can, I can attest to that, but that's another story. Um Victoria's having trouble sleeping. She's got two big questions on her mind. Uh, she's restless, unable to sleep. One question is this fellow named Curtis, who's made a marriage proposal to her. And the other question is this mysterious black-haired giant who haunts her recurring dreams. Uh, now, in, in Chapter 4, there was someplace I think she uh, had concluded that she couldn't marry Curtis because of that stranger. But, you know, that sounds just a little uh, weird, saying you can't marry a real-life human being. 
um, because you've got this dream person on your mind. But Curtis, actually, from all the people she knows, Curtis comes closer to to, to resembling this dream character than anybody else that she knows. She, the, he is described, he, Curtis, is described as, and this is a quote, a tall, athletic, appearing man, the one man she, that's Victoria, had ever met who came nearest to realization of her dream man. So she's in a quandary, unquote. Mm-hmm. Now, late in the evening, Victoria decides to go for a walk. Now, everyone else, most, well, most everyone else is already retired for the evening. Uh, and while this may be Lord Greystoke's compound, it is still Africa, and anyone who's read Tarzan books knows Africa by day is a dangerous place and even more dangerous by night. There are animals who hunt by night. Now, one of these is an old lion who we've called Old Raffles in the story. Uh, he's a sheep killing lion. That's his specialty, and he's always looking for an easy meal. Meanwhile, there's this 100,000-year-old cave guy, new son of new that we've been talking about, who is well-behaved. He is a 100,000-year-old cave guy in this strange place. Uh, he's lurking about on the Greystoke uh, property near the garden where Victoria is walking. Now, he recognizes Victoria, as you've already said, as his beloved Nat Ull. But he's mystified by her different behavior, such as being with these strangers in this strange world. And New is troubled by Victoria's clothing as much as anything else. This is just something that, that he recognizes as just different. So he's laying low and and, and observing, which is a very intelligent thing for him to do. Also outside on the veranda is Victoria's brother, Barney, and this William Curtis fellow who I was just talking about a moment ago. But we know Barney's a good guy. I'm not too concerned about him. And that's that's her brother, so not worried about him. But Curtis, however, has some issues. And at this moment, uh, Curtis is sitting on the veranda in the middle of the night, wearing his pajamas, smoking a cigarette, and cleaning his rifle. So that's what's going on. As I said, it it may be late at night, but the Greystoke compound is a busy place. But but it's important that Victoria realizes or determines if that Curtis is not the dream man, because if she doesn't, if she ends up marrying Curtis, this story is going to be vastly different than the direction. (laughs) So that's an important point, too. So here's our situation. Victoria is wandering around outside. The lion is watching Victoria. New is watching the lion. Tarzan is not accounted for. Normally, he'd be involved in the middle of this, setting up in some tree, but we don't hear a peep out of Tarzan. Victoria is roughly 20 yards away, walking towards New, who is in the rose thicket. Now, she doesn't know New's there. Uh, She is unaware of of anything being close to her. Now, old Raffles, she's not aware of him either. That's that sheep-eating lion I mentioned. Old Raffles crouches to spring, and in doing so, he, he emits an involuntary purr. Uh, Burroughs calls it a purr. I would tend to think more of it as a growl, but I've not been a lion who's about been around the lion who's about to spring. So if uh, Burroughs says it's a purr, then it's a purr, uh, a slight purr. Now this slight purr is just enough to alert New, who jumps up immediately. New's on the job here. He's on the ball. Just enough to alert New, who jumps up with spear in hand to go after the lion, who in turn goes after Victoria. Now tell me, does this passage sound familiar? So listen closely. I'm, I'm reading a, a, a quoted passage. The beast emitted a horrid roar that froze the girl with terror. And then in the face of this terrific charge, the figure of a naked giant leaped past her. She saw a great arm wielding a mighty spear, hurl the weapon at the infuriated beast, and then she swooned. End of passage. Now, does that sound familiar? To me, that sounds like that's straight out of a Tarzan book. But it's, it's not really Tarzan. Does. Yeah, I thought so. It's, it's not Tarzan's describing. It's New, son of New, and his big spear. And so as the lions roar, Victoria sees New throw his spear, and then Victoria faints, which I think is probably grounds for fainting. Mm-hmm. Uh, racing around the house, Curtis, in his pajamas with his rifle he was cleaning, sees a movement in the bushes and shoots. Uh, Barney uh, locates Victoria, gets her inside the house, while the men who have gathered to, in response to all the noise and racket, remove the spear from the body of the lion. Now, this spear is significant. We'll talk about that here in a minute. A, a search of the grounds and of the plains beyond are fruitless because New lies in a clump of flowers just beneath their noses with a bullet wound in his head. Now, that's the end of Chapter 6. So before I move on, any thoughts or comments regarding Chapter 6 and this exciting incident <laughs> out in the garden in the middle of the night? Um, it, it, it is another great action scene. Um, I will say this is another case where I have to say Tarzan seemed to drop the ball because it's hard to believe he would not have smelled out New's unconscious body 
or been able to easily track him the next day after New has, has woken up and gone off. So uh, I, I'm actually going to stop popping on that because I don't want to sound like we're saying it's uh, it, the novel suffers at all before it because it is a wonderful adventure story. But another case where Burroughs was making sure we didn't focus on Tarzan, but was focusing on his new hero, New. So yeah. Well, well, don't don't feel bad about pointing it out because I was going to point it. Out. <laughs> um, Scott, do you have anything there? No, I. Um, the point that uh, Tim made and that you were going to make too is I thought about that reading that scene is uh, I'm so used to Tarzan's nose wrinkling up as he sensed the spore or something else <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I wouldn't expect uh, New to be that close and. He not able to find him because he's in some flowers or, or long grass. But mm-hmm. again, I'm just going with the story flow, you know. <laughs> sure. Now, well, I, if if Burroughs had said that Tarzan was off attending some other business someplace, uh, that would have solved a lot of these concerns. I think that we're having. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was the case, but Burroughs didn't tell us that. Go ahead, Scott. You have yeah. something. Uh, no, I I had one other thing I I thought of. We we later find out we, within a few chapters we find out that Curtis is kind of a jerk uh, when it <laughs> comes right down to it. I wonder if his willingness to shoot without knowing for sure what he's shooting at um, is our first hint that he's not the cool guy that uh, you know Barney thinks he is. So well, that, that's a very good point because because he shows a willingness to shoot later on without knowing all the facts. So we'll talk about right, that here. Yeah, and if you're a, you're a hunter. You know you don't shoot unless you've clearly identified your your target because uh, you don't want your yeah. yeah you don't want your hunting buddy's head on your wall as a trophy. Yeah, so. once once you pull that trigger, things can change. Mm-hmm. Instantly. Mm-hmm. All right, if nothing else, I'll push along here to chapter seven. We're still in um, part one. This is chapter and, and this book isn't in, in, in two parts, by the way. That's why I'm referring uh, to the part. So part one, chapter seven, this is entitled Victoria obeys the call. So in the morning, this is after the incident in the garden where, um, uh, Curtis fired his rifle and the lion uh, attempted to, uh, a lion was brought down by the spear. So in the morning, the men give Victoria news spear, which she recognizes from her dreams. The spear in her hands is tangible proof that the caveman of her dreams is a real living person. So what prior to this moment, what was only in a dream has now become real life. That spear, you can't deny the existence of that spear. And she recognizes it too. Barney recommends, uh, by your part, Barney remembers Victoria's statement. Quote, he carries a great spear, stone tipped. I should know it the moment that I saw it, unquote. That's what she said. And she swears by that. Her statement has proven prophetic. Barney is concerned. <laughs> He'll he ought to be concerned. This is strange. He is well aware of her fear of earthquakes and mice, which is all that, all, not all that not unusual, not at all. But now this business is strange. So now he's got a spear, a caveman, and a dream to, to worry about, and, and the safety of his sister, needless to say. Barney, fearing for her safety, plans to take Victoria back home. That would be back home, I imagine, in the USA. But the day before they are to leave, the dead sheep is discovered. This is left over from the um, garden incident. And they find where New had been wounded, but now New is gone. Once again, uh, something that Tarzan did not detect. Of course, Tarzan may have been occupied by doing something else. There's also a footprint uh, that should, in my opinion, should have been spotted by Tarzan the night old Raffles uh, attack. Uh, Tarzan would have found it in his other 24 some odd adventures, uh, but didn't find it here. And he was involved. I do recall now he was involved in that search. Victoria, and no one else sees this, Victoria sees a trail of blood, but does not tell anyone. Now, so they found signs that something was laying in those bushes. They, they've seen the footprint. It was a bare, bare human footprint, I might add. And, um, and, and Victoria spotted this trail of blood. So those are all remnants of news visit. So there's so the tie that in with the personal spear. These are all things Tarzan should have spotted or smelled, as we've, as we've already discussed. I'm already repeating it because it's written in my notes here. Victoria convinces Barty. Bar- now, they are talking about leaving. And Victoria's... Um, Packing so they can leave, but she does convince Barney to go hunt the buffalo bull that he had wanted to hurt. That there was story or talk of a, a herd of buffalo nearby, north of the East State. So uh, Victoria convinces him to go hunt his buffalo so he can get that done. And she's going to pack for a while. 
But later on, she gets to thinking, uh, not soon later on, she gets to thinking about all these clues and whoever threw that spear, her missing caveman. She takes Turquoise with her. Now, he's one of the uh, Lord Greystoke's wolfhounds. And I, I looked around for this. I was thinking that we had the name of the other wolfhound. I was thinking there was a pair of them, but I could not locate that name. Now, we know, of course, Turquoise was uh, one of the, the Mangani that uh, Tarzan grew up with. I believe it was his foster brother, so to speak, as I recollect. And she takes, it does take her big game, big game rifle, and she, and she sets the turquoise on the trail of, of the blood spot that she saw. She does avoid a leopard, and she does avoid a lion, to her credit, as she's making her way through the jungle. Uh, Victoria is concerned that the blood who sent turquoise is following could have belonged to old raffles, and maybe perhaps, that being the lion, and maybe perhaps is, perhaps is leading us to the mate of this lion. So that can be a dangerous business. But it's a risk she's feels worth taking. Turquoise does lead Victoria to, uh uh-oh, that's the saber tooth, uh uh-oh, to this cave where Nu lies sick with a fever for his infected head wounds. The Nu's in sorry shape right now. It's a good thing she happened along. But through Victoria's efforts, the fever does abate. She helps uh, helps him overcome the fever. Nu Nu settles into a restful sleep with her jacket as a pillow for his head. Remember that part. He's using her jacket as a pillow. Uh, Victoria watches over him and new, uh, uh sleeps peacefully, and she falls asleep, too, right there in the cave of O.O. That's the end of Chapter 7. Any comments or questions from you all? I, I do like that we see definitely that Victoria is a capable and brave person. Um, we were told that earlier, but now we actually get to see it. Um, and I do think it's interesting, because Turkaz turned out to be an the ape, the original ape, turned out to be an enemy of Tarzan's, and he actually... Kills Turkaz to save Jane, doesn't he? If I'm remembering correctly. Yes, as I as I recollect, it was Turkaz who gave Tarzan that scar. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Sure of I mean, I just wonder if if the dog Turkaz was like a butt ugly dog or something. It's kind of interesting that he would take the name of an old enemy and use it for a name of of one of his dogs. Um, Maybe the dog has some behavior problems. I'd be careful about calling that dog Bud Ugly where he might hear you. <laughs> <laughs> he may not like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it just might be uh, respect for an old enemy um, or um, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of nostalgia for the ape tribe because we know that even when he was married to Jane, he sometimes would wish he could just be back in the jungle again. So, yeah. Who knows? It's just kind of interesting he uses that name for one of his dogs. I agree. It's probably not one of those hooks that Burroughs left for future use and for, for us mm-hmm. to press fans to wonder about, maybe some writer to exploit someday. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably a backstory there. Yeah. Scott, anything? No, I'm good on that part. Okay. I just want to make sure I leave you out. All right, I, so was, I was just thinking about a couple of things about Turcons that I'm going to mention later. So I, got, I was kind of drifting down a different dog path there for a minute. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Okay. Um, <laughs> so then I'll push on to uh, Chapter 8. Now we're still in Part 1. This Chapter 8 is entitled Captured by Arabs. Victoria recognizes through all this that she is two people, one being Victoria Custer, a modern woman, and the other, Nat O mate to a caveman. She comes to this conclusion. Uh, Victoria, appro- this is after spending time with New while he's still recovering there in the cave of O'O. Victoria approaches this new life with confidence and has no regrets about abandoning modern day living. Well, she signed on this pretty easily. Uh, she may want to reassess that feeling after a month of living in caveman times and probably won't get to take her rifle with her in the caveman times either. But we'll explore that trip here later on. Victoria was happy. I think probably understanding the situation that she was in she reached some level of happiness i think she found re- but and also she's got a living breathing new right there in front of her this is the guy she's been dreaming about so she has to be relieved to find that the man of her dreams is a real person so she's not going to be stuck with the curtis guy uh who is is the guy for her and he's right here all she has to do is get him uh, recovered to good health and then figure out where, where the two of them will go together from this point now so Feeling good about things, and New's still asleep in the cave, Victoria goes down to the stream to fetch some water. Meanwhile, Arabs happen by 
they see uh, they see some activity here at this cave. They club Turkos, uh, hit it pretty hard, knock him out, and then they capture Victoria. The Arabs head north with the intention of selling Victoria to the Sultan of Fulag. Now it's important to note that Nu has slept through all of this. Uh, he he had had no conversation with Victoria that morning, so he wakes up uh, wondering where Victoria is. Uh, having self-doubts himself, wondering if perhaps he dreamt of her talking about turning the tables. So he's just confused. And, and of course, he's getting over this injury also. So New Wake's expecting to see Nat Ol. I'm, he would call, I'll call her Victoria. He would call her Nat Ol. But her absence so depresses him, he relapses into fever and delirium. So he's back in sorry shape and now without his nursemaid. Really, for everything New has experienced, and I've already commented on this, but bears repeating, for everything New has seen and experienced in this modern world, he has really remained pretty calm and, and uh, I will all say business-like, for want of a better word. Um, Barney, Curtis, and Butso are out uh, looking around for a Victoria. Uh, they do find Turkos at the spring where he's clubbed by the Arabs, and they find New in the cave. And there's no mention of Tarzan's whereabouts, so he can be off on some other errand or something. Now, normally, and here I go uh, with a Tarzan alert. Normally, in, a, in your typical Tarzan book, he would have been up at the crack of dawn um, or sooner and already found the cave and already in pursuit of the Arabs. But not, not the case here. So he's, he's got something else going on that we never do find out about. Mm -hmm. So Brown recognizes the spear, and Curtis wants to kill New for killing Victoria. Now, this is, again, an example of Curtis jumping to conclusions, as we said just a moment ago. He's already tried sentence and is ready to execute New, uh, thinking that Victoria's dead with no evidence of that at all, that she's dead or harmed or anything. She, she's not there, but no evidence that New has actually hurt her. Barney will not permit the killing of an unconscious man. Kudos to Barney for standing up for, for principles there. Barney wants to find Victoria and find the truth of what happened. Barney does recognize the possibility that New knows what, what, what happened, but communicating with New thus far has been a challenge. Uh, Turkos, that uh, wolfhound who was injured, is revived by the search party, comes in, lays a protective head on New's breast, allowing the others to approach but not Curtis. In fact, in fact, um, I almost skipped over this part. When Curtis was wanting to um, kill New out of punishment for a crime that New did not commit, um, uh, Barney said, and Barney objected. Uh, Barney said, well, let's let the dog decide it. So, um, so, uh, and figuring the dogs are pretty good judges of people, which I think they can be. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, in a fictional book, you hope that they are. Um, so, uh, Turkos comes in, he makes his way around the cave, and finally he goes over by New and, and sits over there by New and growls at Curtis whenever Curtis approaches him. So that, that saves, uh, that saves New from Curtis there for the time being, at least. Uh, Barney does try to question New as to as to um, uh, Nat Ol slash Victoria's whereabouts, but New doesn't understand Barney. There's that communication issue that I mentioned a moment ago. So they all go back to the the, the Great Stokey State uh, bungalow with New on a litter, with a uh, Turkhouse beside him, and the rest of the party continues to search for Victoria. That concludes chapter eight. Any thoughts or comments? Um, I also kind of like the bit where they use Turkhouse, the dog, to. Um you know, to try and get a sense of whether New is guilty or not. Um, and it is a nice touch. I'm not sure it would work in real life. My dog, Barnaby, would nuzzle up to a serial killer if the serial killer gave him a treat. So, so, <laughs> so would mine. <laughs> yeah. So, but it is a nice touch. Um, I think we get still another, I hadn't thought about this till we were talking about it just now. But it is obvious that Burroughs is gradually setting up Curtis to be the jerk we find out he is. First in shooting without having a good target, and now in, in just assuming that New is a murderer and wanting to summarily execute him. Um, so uh, it's really a nice bit of characterization on Burroughs' part that he, it just doesn't come out of the blue that Curtis is a bad guy later on. We get all these hints of it beforehand, uh, and it's really well done. Um, the, uh, another thing I wanted to mention was, um, you know, Victoria realizes she's also Nat Ole, the mate of New who lived a hundred thousand years ago. So I don't believe that Burroughs was in any way suggesting reincarnation exists in real life, but it is clear that he's using reincarnation as a plot device here 
So within the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe, it is something that happens at least sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, and I was also I uh, wanted to comment again about uh, uh, Turkaz uh, along with New there, because normally, you know, you take something going back to the story of the Golden Lion, the animals that really retain a huge piece of loyalty for Tarzan. Mm-hmm. The fact that Turkaz would take off with New like this both, I think, accents the idea that Nu is the main character. This is pretty much his story, him and Victoria, but that, and I'll be mentioning a little more about that later, too. But also the fact that, again, like the monkeys, maybe there's this primal animal instinct in which uh, um, uh, Turkaz is partnering up with, with Nu like this, when normally... The animals, for the most part, won't uh, uh, abandon Tarzan or take off from mm-hmm. from their posts. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, okay. Uh, well, Jess, do you want to move on to Chapter 9? I was hoping you would ask. Yes, let's do that, shall we? Chapter 9, we're still in Part 1, Chapter 9. This is entitled, New Goes to Find Nat Old. So Victoria is out of the picture for the time being because she's still held prisoner by the Arabs and they're on the march. They've got plans. So Barney and New return back to the Greystoke uh, estate where Barney nurses New back to health and begins to teach him English. English, needless to say, this is a long process. Barney thinks that New may be the one person that can answer Barney's questions as to the fate of Victoria. Uh, Barney does recognize and, you know, the, some of what Victoria said about the spear and all that has, has come has come to be true. So Barney does recognize a strange relationship between New and Victoria slash Nadal. Meanwhile, the search parties cannot find Victoria. And New, who really doesn't know what happened because he was still asleep in the cave, waits patiently for Nadal's return. And he's frustrated because he can't really communicate with all these people either. But he is a good student where English is concerned. It just takes time. Uh, there's no mention of Tarzan's activities other than he directs Turkaz to guard and restrict New to the estate. Yeah. So he's got he's got Turkaz keeping an eye on New, but we'll find out how good that is later yeah. on. If Tarzan had realized that New spoke Mangani, that would have speeded things up considerably. That's a very good point. Uh, I was thinking that very same thing. It could have. It could have solved, uh, solved a lot of problems right there. So after three weeks, give or take here, after three weeks, Curtis once again confronts New. This is at the Greystoke uh, estate. And, and clearly he hates New and blames New for Victoria's disappearance. Curtis demands to know what New has done with Victoria. New does not know who Victoria is. He knows who Nadol is, doesn't realize it's the same person. Curtis calls him a liar. A Barney gets involved. Barney intervenes as Curtis is about to draw his revolver on New. Once again, we've got Curtis brandishing a weapon. Uh, and threatening an unarmed man. Uh, Barney no longer respects Curtis, who has shirked his duties in, in addition to this. Curtis has shirked his duties in the search party camps. C- Curtis complains of the work too much and the conditions of camp life. So uh, he's already gotten under Barney's skin on, on top of, of, of his uh, attitude here towards New. This triggers the long-awaited discussion between New and Barney as to Victoria's fate, because Barney's frustrated, too. He wants to find out what happened to his sister. So, so New asks, who is Miss Custer? New cannot believe that Nat Ull is Barney's sister. New, of course, going back 100,000 years, uh, thinks that her brother is Ott, the son of Tha, who that was 100,000 years ago. So it's all very confusing. It would be very confusing to anybody. Uh, despite their progress in new learning English, there is still a failure to communicate. Uh, Barney explains to New that New was the last person to see Victoria in the cave, but New still can't answer Barney's questions because New was asleep or unconscious at the time. New wants to look for Nadol, but Barney stops him. Barney won't let him leave. So late that night, New escapes taking his spear, axe, and knife along with Turkals, who's supposed to be keeping an eye on him. And and also, somewhere in the story, I think it's that instant, uh, 
Tarzan assures everyone that Satur calls his behavior and how dependable he is. But this is another example of, of Tarzan not quite knowing uh, the extent that his own dog would go to. Granted, uh, Turkals may recognize, some dogs do have intelligence, I've experienced that, and Turkals may recognize it's the right thing for him to go with, with Newt, but Tarzan doesn't pick up on that. Mm -hmm. So that concludes my comments here for Chapter 9, and I think that takes care of me for Part 1. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, it does. And um, uh, I, sh I should I think we should say that... Um, Burroughs often liked to team his heroes up with a very loyal animal character. He did that a lot. Um, yes. So here we have uh, New and Turkaz, and that can join with Bowen Tyler and Nobbs the dog, and with Tarzan and the Golden Lion, and with Von Horst from uh, Back to the Stone Age with the mammoth he um, he uh, befriends, or David Innes in Pellucidor with the hyena dog he befriends. So all of these cases, um, I actually did one of our mini podcasts, the mini podcast number one. I talk about some of the awesome pets. I, I didn't think of Turkaz here when I did that, or I would have mentioned him in that podcast. Well, there's but, also you know, the panther out of Beast of Tarzan, which will be discussed soon. Yes. Another there's one, that one as well. The one of so, Tarzan's experiences in training a, uh, a wild animal to be his buddy. Yeah. And Burroughs himself was obviously an animal lover. Uh, I think these, these, that's reflected in his novels by the number of times the hero um, has a has a loyal animal as a uh, companion. Um, so uh, we're coming up in the last few chapters of the novel. Scott, you were going to take over with chapter 10. Yeah, chapter 10 through 13 will uh, wrap up the uh, first part of, of the story here. It actually stands alone, um, we'll see at the end, has its own own story as it was originally you know, in the magazines. But uh, chapter 10 is called On the Trail. And in this, Barney wakes up and, uh, uh, of course, uh, New uh, is gone and Turkaz is gone with him. And so he sounded the alert. And the uh, camp, the people are up around trying to figure out what happened or where they may have gone. I find it interesting that Tarzan or Lord uh, Greystoke is very insistent that um, in his escape, he must have killed, uh, uh, knew must have killed the dog, must have killed Turkaz. The only reason I can really think for the way he's insisting on it at this point is in a minute or two, uh, uh, I think it was set up for a line at the uh, end of the chapter. But anyway, while they're doing this, new and Turkaz are... Um, Going back up, Turkaz is heading back up uh, the mountainside to the cave uh, where he had uh, killed uh, o -O or Uu -U or <laughs> had the saber to it. And um, when he gets there, he takes off the fangs uh, or saber tooth, extra large fangs that he has there, maybe a couple other teeth, and hangs them off. I think like on he has like a strip or a belt or something off to his side. To me, without him saying so much, to me, that kind of reminds me of when you read uh, whether of, um, even some modern cultures, but uh, older cultures, uh, you know, um, Native Americans, uh, uh, First People nations here and, um, over in Asia and over in Africa and stuff, where they take these tokens or omens and wear them to brace for battle or another type of uh, superstition, good luck type things. That makes sense to both of you. Yeah, yeah I, I I thought it was a, a, a very natural thing for New to do. I thought it made sense to me, and it does fit in where you have, you know, pre-industrial cultures often take uh, that sort of things as a talisman. So I thought it made perfect sense. Yeah, d yeah, that's where I thought it came from too. I, I think um, it was keepsake or as a little trophy as to your accomplishment. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's true too, because if they are going where they think there's going to be war or, or unknowns or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like building the strength in, upon them because of their achievements they've done before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so um, he gets those from the cave and he's going to, 
head out and try and do follow the trail trail of the uh, um, Arabian uh, caravan uh, in which uh, Victoria is at. Now I find this interesting too. Uh, you were just talking about the uh, the companions, Golden Eye, and going off the adventures and stuff here. Mm-hmm. So here, uh, uh, new with Turkaz is very much doing what we talked about in other books that we see Tarzan would do. So he's really bringing uh, new up to this level, I think, as, as was mentioned earlier, maybe for more adventures, more series. Because here they talk about him and Dog going along and sniffing the spurs. And do, he's doing all the things we're used to seeing Tarzan do when he's on the hunt, on the move. Um, uh, there, uh, and while they're on the uh, on the way to uh, try and catch up the caravan, I believe it said, let's see, he covered, he and the dog covered in a day, or about a day's time, what it took a week for the caravan to move through. So he he's doing the whole thing, moving fast, uh, uh, going on his own or the dog following him. Uh, and we'd see this in other stories where Tarzan would, Again, not trying to overshadow Tarzan, but where uh, um, Tarzan would break off from the group because he could move fast and get somewhere in another day as opposed to a group of people that take a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I see a lot of the similarities there where he might have uh, been building them up to that part. Uh, uh, Then uh, word comes about the caravan. I'm going to read it here. Because I thought this was really cinematic. Again, we uh, we talk about this for Burroughs in a lot of his writings, but the way he captures everything here. While Greystoke was questioning the fellow, he let drop the fact that among the other prisoners of the Arabs was a young white woman. Instantly, commotion reigned upon the Greystoke ranch. White men were jumping into the field, khaki looking to firearms and ammunition, lesser black body servants should have neglected some essential. Stable boys were saddling the horses, and the sleek Ivan warriors of Uziri were greasing their black hides, adjusting barbaric war bonnets, streaking faces, breasts, limbs, and bellies with ochre, vermilion, or ghastly bluish-white, and looking to slim shield, poison arrow, and formidable war spare. I could just see that, like in a Tarzan movie. Where mm-hmm. they all like, let's get up and go. Let's move. And you see the whole camp getting up and bracing, getting ready for war. And in that paragraph, he, he's describing what would make an excellent one, two, three minute scene where everyone's just rushing to get everything ready and they're, they're ready to take off like that. Um, uh, now, in contrast, Tarzan's staying with the party here. Whereas we were talking in a lot of other ventures, he would split off to move faster, which is actually what Turkaz, or not Turk, well, Turkaz, along with New are doing. They're, they're, they're much farther ahead already to uh, uh, try and catch up uh, yeah. with the caravan. I agree. If this were a Tarzan novel, um, Tarz, I think Tarzan would have broken off his own. You guys follow as fast as you can. I'm going to go ahead, find him, you know, maybe get the girl away, all of that. So he's new is definitely filling in as for Tarzan in every way as the protagonist of this of of um, of this story. I agree. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, come up as they're moving along, they're starting to find traces of where New's been through. Uh, whether they're picking up the signs or the spore, the uh, uh, trail he's leaving behind, there are different things like that. And then uh, right at the end of the chapter, and this is where I think was a setup for uh, a gray stoke insisting the dog was dead. Uh, First sign of him, which meant uh, meant new, was the carcass of a bull buffalo. Straight through the heart was a great hole that they now knew was made by the passage of the ancient stone-tipped spear. Strips had been knife cut from the sides, and the belly was torn as though by a wild beast. Brown stooped to examine the ground about the bowl. When he straight it, straightened up, he looked at Greystoke and laughed. Didn't I understand you to say that he must have killed the dog? 
Look here. They ate side by side from the body of their kill. So uh, that's the only reason I could think, because I don't know why else he'd be insisting, except he was foreshadowing or setting it up so he could kind of add this little funny line at the end, like at yeah, the end I, of the chapter I, here, or the scene I, of a movie. I just think Tarzan was assuming that Turkaz was going to be loyal to him and couldn't imagine the dog switching sides, so to speak. So when Turkaz that went too. off with Dew, Tarzan just didn't consider that he would have done it of his own free will. That's a good point, too. <laughs> Talking about the animal's loyalties, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's what happened here, but it just seems out of character to me for Tarzan to make that, that mistake in assuming something. Mm-hmm. But but n- nobody's perfect, including Tarzan. That's true. <laughs> uh, but that scene where the, everyone's coming together to start going after that, that to me really showed the uh, picture we're used to of Tarzan, a man of action, and everyone about him in tune with, let's get busy. <laughs> Yeah, they still show Tarzan as being an effective leader, even if he's dropping the ball a little on his jungle skills in this in this book. <laughs> Doesn't now, know his own. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking that poor Barney must be thinking that he can't get a quiet vacation no matter what he does. You know, he, he'd been in Europe and got involved in a civil war, and then he comes over to Tarzan's estate to do a little hunting, and now he's he's rushing after Arab slave traders to, to um, you know, to, to save his sister. He, he's thinking the whole time, I just needed to have gone to the beach at Florida. and, and... <laughs> maybe, maybe he'll book passage to Barsoom for his next next. next <laughs> so, yeah. So we're learning if Barney Custer wants to go on a vacation, do not go with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyone want to go swimming off the Jersey coast? <laughs> <laughs> He'll end up running into a like prehistoric shark or something. Da, so. Da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the next part we come into chapter eleven in the first part here is called the abduction, and this even there, <laughs> there's so much action in this one. There's so many. I, sometimes I felt like I was either watching a ping pong match, a volleyball match, or. A, <laughs> Or, or a tennis match or something. Because it's just like bing, 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 bing. And I, I'm, I'm not even going to cry and mention every detail in here. <laughs> That's crazy. But a lot goes on. They've been on, uh, 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 Victoria's been uh, captive for several weeks now um, while they're moving through uh, on the route to take them off. And uh, uh, the uh, head, the chief, the shake is... Uh, I'm going to say Ibn or Ibn Aswad. Uh, uh, it's I-B-N. So, I think um, it's Ibn, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Yeah. Uh, so he, he's uh, taking her, and she's not looking forward to a future that could be future that's probably awaiting her at the village or slave sale or wherever um, she might become a victim of. And then he has a, a lieutenant or right hand man uh, uh, that Sheikh does called Abdul Makaram. Makaram? Abdul Makaram, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we see that he's really a slimy sort. Mm-hmm. He gets the hots for bacteria there and uh, um, tries to put a move on her abuse her in certain ways while they're on horseback and uh, uh, the sheikh sees something's going on goes back there and tells them you know stay about your work stay away from her and, and puts someone else in charge of, of her and as they move on uh, they end up uh, at a village where other villages they just sort of march through or taking what they wanted but um, for their journey this village they the villagers hold off. They they like put up a wall. They're ready to fight them and go to war. They're not expecting this. And there's a lot of commotion and this uh, starts small fights which are spreading. And during this time, uh, Abdul sees the opportunity where everyone's mixing up 
maybe getting killed, getting in a fight here. He takes off and goes back to where the uh, other guy is, uh, as you want to call it, standing guard or, or taking care of Victoria. And he comes up and says uh, that the Sheikh had asked him to come back and, and uh, take her now, and he should go join the rest of them up in the fight. And he's like, oh, you're a liar. The Sheikh told me that. I was not to keep let her out of my sight with nobody, especially you. And um, just standing there right there, Abdul has a rifle across his lap, uh, sitting on a horse or across his legs kind of around. His, if they're wearing, he might be bareback, but it'd be across where the horn of the saddle probably would be. And I got the feeling, as I remember it, he never even lifted up the gun. He just sort of turned sideways, put his finger on it. Trigger and fired the gun from there right through the uh, other guy's gut. Killed him instantly or pretty close to it. And he took off with uh, Victoria at that point. And they take off through the jungle there to go and hide and, and um, tell they get to a uh, site a couple hours later where he feels it's safe for her to dismount. And I think that I'm looking through the after here yeah he's trying she's try, trying to escape a couple times but doesn't isn't really able to until they come up along this stream and then he gets off and the, uh, ties up both of the uh, donkeys and has her get come down on the ground dismount from there and that's the where chapter 11 ends any, any comments on that um, yeah, I, I do agree that this is a really action packed chapter. And in fact, Burroughs has obviously been increasing the pace of the novel is he of this part of the novel as he comes up to its conclusion. So he's got all the background information he needs out there. We've met all the characters. Um, so he's just moving the action along. And, um, I will say that he comes up, the Arabs have like a three week head start. He comes up with a perfectly reasonable way to get all the various characters together at the same time. Um, he makes it clear that the Arabs are moving relatively slowly and pausing to raid other villages along the way. So that gives yeah. you a chance to catch up. And it also gives the Greystoke rescue party a chance to catch up because they can move in a fast straight line to try and catch up with them. Whereas uh, the slave traders have been kind of zigzagging and moving more slowly. Um, yeah, so all, stop and buy the villages and stuff. Yes. So it all makes logical sense that they all come together at the end. He's not ignoring the passage of Burroughs is not ignoring the passage of time or geography. He simply had the different characters moving at different speeds to logically bring them all together for the conclusion. And it's another sign of how good an adventure writer he was, um, that he makes all this work out so well. You just anything you want to add on that? Uh, no, I agree with everything you all said. Nothing, nothing new from me. But thank you. Um, okay, the next one is uh, chapter twelve. There'll be one more to go after this on part one, and uh, this one's called "The Cave In Finds His Mate." Now, a good chunk of this actually, that's interesting because it's like a slowdown after a previous chapter. Uh, new is. Um, continuing on his course and on his tracking and hunt. But he spends a lot of time, and I guess we would call it self-reflection. Um, how does he fit into this world? Uh, what kind of person is he compared to the other people around? How does he rate, as uh, they said in the beginning, we, you know, he's supposed to be like a troglodyte. How does he fit in with other tribals or the animal kingdom, and he says, he sees that there are animals that haven't been, he never knew of like uh, what we know as of giraffes, and uh, they don't seem to be as ferocious or as big as they were there, and he wonders about his place, almost like what's his place in the universe. I will, <laughs> I will have to say as a troglodyte, <laughs> and as, as was mentioned earlier, he's actually a, a strong very old, strong looking, handsome man. Because mm -hmm. uh, if he looked like Troglodyte in that Crawford movie, 
<laughs> there wouldn't be anybody falling in love with him. Oh, the, the, the Joan Crawford movie called Trog. I, yeah, uh, Trog, yeah. Trog, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One for the ages. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so let's see. Yeah, so he's uh, going through here, and as you mentioned before, the different characters. Uh, uh, Barney is going on a, a straighter route or a different route. Trying to catch up with the uh, the the uh, Arabian caravan, the raiders that way, and uh, then uh, while uh, New has kind of gotten over, they gotten by the self reflection and the, the thoughts for a couple of pages there. He's moving on and finds a donkey trail, and it's not after long after that he hears noise and he hears. Uh, Victoria, or as he he would call her, Natul. Natul, is that right? Um, screaming. So he takes off to uh, go go to her rescue, and he's able to get up and catch Abdul and kills Abdul right there. And let's see. Let me go back. And I think did he grab? Who was that? Yeah, Ab Abul was planning on raping Victoria. He like uh, like uh, sunk his uh, yeah. teeth into his neck or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, it is a what we consider a very savage, barbaric way to kill someone, but he's doing it as someone who's tried to survive a hundred thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. There really are no rules. <laughs> you just live or die. So uh, Abdul. Uh, it's killed there, and he's rescued uh, Natul, who Victoria now isn't just so much doing so much, am I Victoria or am I Natul? She's really looking at herself more as being Natul now. And she kisses him and, and realizes that as Natul, she truly is in love with him. But also she's wearing, realizing the paradox. She's worried about what will people say if she brought him back to civilization and and how would it look and the presumptions or comments people might make, which I could see that that, that that's plausible for thoughts like that to go by. Mm -hmm. But she also um, doesn't think more than her. Uh, she's more worried that New would, New would not be able to live in that type of world or that society. And then she comes and, and also realizes she is no way prepared to live in a jungle or a, a troglodyte or caveman style life that she couldn't really survive that either. So she's trying to work this out and explain to him that that um, they could uh, Live yeah, together like that. Yeah, there's. Yeah, you know, trying to tell them there's no way they can make this work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so he takes that into account. He's uh, thinking there about killing himself by running the spirit room. But I did have one question: if he killed himself here and was reborn, and she's what in her twenties or thirty, mm -hmm. so by the time he got was reborn and got to be twenty or thirty. Would she be like 60 or would this be like that? Uh, or, or, would this, or would this be like the uh, 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 the Christopher Reeve uh, uh, a movie where somehow they kind of retain their respective ages when they time travel? Except, of course, in the end of that movie, she's really old too, but uh, okay, I'll stay on track. Anyway, <laughs> I, I just like oh, he's got to start being reborn. He's gonna, she's gonna be a whole lot older than him. But um, and uh, anyway, so he's braced a spear for him to fall down and kill, to kill himself. And uh, meantime, Turkaz has noticed something's crawling at the jungle behind them. Uh, thoughts? Um, I do think that the emotions that Victoria feels here and in the next chapter, too, which I know you'll get to in a moment, are very human. Um, I think it's natural for her to stop and think about 
you know, how will this work? I'm in love with New, but he has no idea about civilization. Tarzan was able to adjust to living in civilization when he needed to. But New is coming not just from the jungle, as Tarzan did, but from 100,000 years earlier. And um, if New and Victoria together had become regular characters in a series of novels, it would have been interesting to see how Burroughs would have dealt with this, how, how it would have differed from Tarzan's own journey uh, with Jane. You know, would they have had to have stayed in the jungle, living in a cave? Would Victoria have been able to adjust to that? Um, all of that, it just does raise interesting questions and uh, makes it kind of too bad that New didn't come up as a, as a regular replacement hero. Because, um, um, you know, in part two, he's gonna send them all, send, you know, adjust the time back 100,000 years and kind of tie their stories up. So, yeah. so we'll never get to see how that might have played out. But Victoria's concerns here are very human and very understandable. But it does open up those story possibilities. So Burroughs could, could have gotten several books out of that. I believe he could have, yes. Um, I, I mean, Burroughs, Tarzan could be very sophisticated in, in, a, in a civilized company. Um, I don't know if New could have ever pulled that off. So, Tarzan yeah. also had the advantage, of, while he may not have used it much, he also had the advantage of having position and wealth in British society. That's true. And New would have had nothing. Um, of course, I guess Barney was pretty well off. Could have given him a job at the factory or something. Over <laughs> at, um, oh, um, the country that Barney uh, became king of. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Luthia or Luthnia? Luth or... Yeah, that's it. Uh, maybe he could have found something over there for him. <laughs> Been in the guard, the royal guard there. So. Yeah. Okay, then we'll wrap up part chapter 13 of part one. Um, and at this point here, uh, Tarzan and those with him have caught up to the uh, caravan. And uh, I, again, like you mentioned before, the timing uh, with the caravan being involved in the fighting and battles and stuff they have. Mm -hmm. And he wants to know where the white girl is. And the fake says, I, you know, oh, white girl, we don't have any white girl. But someone else who's been captured there as a slave said, Yes, she was here, and she, she was uh, taken by the other person. So um, they sped out to search throughout the jungle and the trails there from that. And meantime, um, uh, Curtis shows up again. He's who the Turkaz is crawling at, hiding in a jungle, and um, he's getting ready to step out and sees that New has braced his spear and is going to kill himself, so he's like, I'm just going to hang out, let him kill himself, and waltz in, and I'll have, a, have her as mine. But before he can kill himself, uh, Victoria's like, no, stop, don't. She goes, I love you, I can't, I can't let you, I can't let you kill yourself, don't, we, we're here now, you know, and uh, so she stops him from killing himself, so uh, Curtis then comes out, Wants to kill him, but Turkaz, um, to the rescue, you know, attacks him and rips him apart. So he uh, got his comeuppance, I guess you could say. And uh, Victoria, at this point, is uh, going to stay with New, and they walk off from the area. Not too long after that, uh, her brother, her Barney, makes his way through the jungle. And um, sees tracks from the donkeys and see the donkeys, I believe, are still tied up. And, and uh, Curtis is on the dead, torn up and on the ground, dead and mutilated and torn up. And uh, he looks at the uh, footprints and assumes that uh, New and uh, Victoria have um, returned or she's returning with New to, to the jungle or somewhere that they consider themselves will be safe and uh, just ponders what that life will be like and if they uh, uh, will um, will be safe, what, what becomes of everybody's life now. And Turkos is still holding back a little and he's kind of 
standing as a barrier a ways away, uh, growling at Barney, Custer telling him, you know, like, stay where you are, don't don't follow, and the dog turns around and disappears, and uh, Barney's there with the tracks of new and his sister in the sand, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess we can save an in-depth discussion of this until next week's episode when we talk about part two, because it's going to turn out that everything from the point where um, Victoria faints in chapter two, when, when there's an earthquake, to this point is just all a dream. Um, so, uh, you know, we can talk about that then when we have the second part of the story as co to give it all proper context. Yeah. Uh, uh, as it ends now, and Burroughs has not written the sequel yet, you know, uh, I think it's fair to consider that he might have been hoping that New would be a regular character in future stories. He and Victoria, in a, you know, the, the caveman from 100,000 years ago existing in the modern jungle um, yeah. uh, with Victoria with him, occasionally interacting with, with uh, civilization or... Um, battling slave traders or doing whatever adventures, uh, you know, maybe they would have stumbled across Paolo Don or what have you. But there is potential here for a whole series of new and Victoria in the jungle, together in the jungle stories. Um, Definitely. Uh, that Burroughs opted not to go out, out with maybe between the time he wrote this in 1913 and wrote the sequel in 1914. Uh, you know, maybe it was that time that the publishers were making it clear to him that they wanted more Tarzan stories. And so he wrapped up news story in a more final way. Yeah. So that's just speculation, of course, but it seems reasonable. I do. I do have one question about Victoria, though. I didn't see any other mention of it in here, and I can't think of uh, if it's ever been mentioned in anything else, a crossover and stuff. but. But uh, the Custer family comes from Nebraska. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if she ever lived in California or Greece or Italy. Uh, I don't know. But um, Nebraska isn't necessarily known for its earthquakes. I'm just wondering where she picked up this phobia. Well, if she, if she is the right reincarnation of Nat all, and no matter how we interpret the the time jumps and the dreams and all that in the end, I think it's clear that she is a reincarnation of that all. She might have had a memory of the earthquake that wiped out her and her tribe that we'll see at the end of part two. Yeah, uh, you're right. That, that does show up in part two. And that, that is part of a, a, what do you want to call it? Maybe a latent memory or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, yeah, good point. Yeah, so I, th I think you can you can explain that. She's got reason from past lives that she doesn't consciously remember that um, that that earthquakes are scary. A fear buried deep within. It's also possible that there might we could you know, check some seismic survey and records, but that there may be once in a great once in a blue moon. And I do mean rare uh, earthquakes in Nebraska. Beatrice, Nebraska is the name of the town. Um, and if they are in, if they do have them, and if they are rare then that can be a frightening experience because thankfully we don't get I don't yeah. myself. We don't get them here very often, but it certainly has my attention when I feel things shake. Well, the, the largest earthquake we have on record here for the U.S., for North America, is, uh, what, is it 1801 uh, in Missouri. Along, it changed the course of Mississippi River and bells in Washington, D.C., and the churches clanging back and forth from the vibrations. Okay, no, I just did a quick search. On, I just did a quick search on it. There have occasionally been minor earthquakes of like the three point and two point on the Richter scale uh, in Nebraska, so they're not completely seismically stable. Yeah, I, th I think almost every state has had a few. Uh, we've even had some up here in, in Minnesota, mm -hmm. but uh, I just <laughs> I, I just try and figure out where'd she pick this up because yeah. yeah, I want. I, I, no, no, I mean, I don't enjoy them. Well, I didn't enjoy them when I lived out in LA. Yeah. <laughs> I, for me, the best explanation is she's past memories from uh, Nat Ull that they give her the spirit yeah. of earthquakes. Oh, oh, I, I agree. I think it, it is a, a reference back to her previous life as Nat Ull. I, I agree with that totally. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Scott, to your point about the New Madrid fault, I'm well, 
well acquainted with that fault and, and the damage that occurred way back when and what it could do in yeah. today's world. So uh, your point is well taken there. That's serious business. Uh, that's why I was hesitant to even mention it because it's been quiet for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It'll go again someday. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. No pushing. <laughs> Um, okay, well, that brings us to the end of our discussion of part one. Our next episode, we'll cover part two, so we will be getting to that. Um, and so we hope that you'll, you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll join us for the next one. Um, also, please check the show notes for a link to our store, which you can find at cafepress.com uh, slash ERB podcast. Um, we do have a lot of great products there with artwork done by a friend of mine, Ben Alvarez, who is an incredible artist. And with the kind permission of ERB Incorporated, we are able to sell uh, merchandise with uh, images from Burroughs stories on it. Um, we will, before long, have a few uh, Eternal Savage products available. Um, but um, in, um, you will also... Um, find other stuff there. I'd like to mention our Tars Tarkas t-shirt. Uh, ben did a wonderful drawing of Tars Tarkas mm -hmm. in full color. So he's in there in living green. And that image on a t-shirt is just really impressive. Um, and I'm going to highlight that one specifically in our show notes. But once you're in the store, you can find Tars Tarkas, you can find Woola, uh, John, Carpen John Carter's um, um, Callet Companion, another man animal uh, team up of you know loyal animal looking after a man um uh you can find a saber-toothed tiger such as oo -oo or oo or however you say his name uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh you know and a lot of other images uh from burroughs stories or just uh burroughs related adventure type imagery so please visit our store um buy something and help make us wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice um, my, my name again is Tim DeForest. Um, you can uh, find my blog at Comics, Old Time Radio, and other cool stuff, and find a link to my books on Amazon.com. Um, so you're welcome to buy those and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. Um, Jess and Scott, you want to say goodbye and plug anything you want to plug? Well, I will mention uh, that uh, I've been drinking decaf coffee tonight. Normally, I'm drinking some of Granny's iced tea, and I do mean iced tea. But tonight, I've been drinking <laughs> decaf coffee uh, using one of the uh, coffee cups that we offer there at that at that uh, website. Uh, and this is the one with the image of a T-Rex on it. It sure does taste good coming out of this coffee cup. So I, I would mention that. Also, we have uh, um, some Griff uh, items there, the um, Triceratops and Paludon. And one of the things that impressed me the most, which I'll be getting, is a set of cufflinks. I, I haven't worn cufflinks in years, but I think it's a good time to start. Griff cufflinks. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's, it's the other things to mention, of course, my Facebook discussion group, for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burrows, come see us on Facebook. Scott? And I, I have to agree with the uh, products in the store there. The artwork is really, really nice. He does a great job on that. And the other thing would be anything sanctioned, licensed like this, or or the books and other releases, the uh, artwork by Joe Jusco, anything Edgar Rice Burroughs related, go out and find something, treat yourself today, because a day with some burrows in your life is a day you're going to enjoy a little more. Mm -hmm. So uh, just thank you again, everybody, and we will be back with another episode soon.